In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound uh, reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, and my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. As you know, there has been some muted, muted upheaval in the canonical world about the meaning of the recent motu proprio, ad duendam charisma, with lots of uh, canonical theories being considered about the meaning of this motu proprio by the Pope, and some concern for some what this really means but in the end we know that the main core of our spirit remains untouched one of those uh, central untouched truths or aspects of our spirit turns around friendship because uh, It's an aspect of our spirit, it's an aspect of our apostolate, how we integrate friendship in our life and how fundamental a part of our life real friendship really is. And also because Jesus changed the whole dynamics of our life from being servants to being friends. He said in St. John chapter 15, I no longer call you servants because... A servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Let's reflect on that phrase. I have called you friends. Of course, if he's insisting on this, the assumption is that perhaps the apostles might have considered him like a master, a teacher, or even the Messiah, and that he would have some kind of authority over them, a teaching authority, and that somehow he would keep them distanced because he was the teacher, they were the disciples, they were the listeners, so to speak, and um, he would just like be teaching, they would be duly listening, like good servants, and maybe the contact would be somewhat cool and formal or distant a kind of exchange of goods. I give you the truth about salvation and you just, you just take it. And some of that might seep into our way of thinking that you know, we, well, we give doctrine and we enlighten others with the truth about life and the doctrine of Christ and the essence of morality that we have learned. But in the end... Well, there's an element of truth to that. We do do that, but not because we are masters. We don't do that because we are teachers, but because we are friends. We are friends of our friends. And this is what we have to look at to see to what extent that is true. To what extent am I really a friend? How rich an experience is this in my life? Because indeed, the spirit of Opus Dei encourages us to have lots of friends, to foment them, to nurture them, to seek them out, to love them truly, to listen to them, and to learn, to learn from our friends. And I'm sure we all have that experience. Uh, We're surrounded by friends. Uh, We deepen in them. We laugh with our friends. We cry with our friends. We are moved with our friends. We have fun with our friends. We just get lots of help from our friends. Like that famous 
song that the Beatles used to say that became a hit in 1967, I get by with a little help from my friends. It was written, as you probably know, it was written by John Lennon and Paul McCartney, and it was released in the album, the famous album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which was released in 1967. That was the name of the album, and one of the one of the one of the songs, one of the tracks there was "I Get By with a Little Help from My Friends," and but that title, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, you know, it's very you know strange to have that there be a band of people getting together because they're lonely, you know, and it is. Uh, it's quite sad, right? It's as though it's suggesting, well, we're always going to be lonely. We're just getting together because we're lonely. And uh, it's sad, right? As though the, this band was written for lonely people who just get by. And in fact, at one point, uh, they sing, I get high with a little help from my friends, right? And, uh, and of course, either this is, I suppose, this is drugs, alcohol, or, you know, or just anything to soften the blow of uh, loneliness, and it seems that uh, Lennon and McCartney decided to let Ringo Starr be the one to sing this one because they were afraid that if, that if he didn't sing enough songs that this might ruin his reputation because he was always just at the back, you know, just, you know, hitting the drums. And, and it was always Lennon McCartney and also George Harrison, of course. They were the main ones singing, but he, he never sang. So they well, let's give him this song. And it was done in a key that was relatively easy to sing. And, um, and perhaps you remember the opening lines of that song. What would you think if I sang out a tune? The, actually, the original song was, What would you think if I sang out, sang out a tune? Would you throw ripe tomatoes at me? But they were afraid that if, uh, you know, if people heard this, since they did everything the Beatles did, they might actually start throwing you know, rotten tomatoes at them, right? Maybe that's where the rotten tomatoes uh, concept came from. But instead, they said, w the opening lines are, what would you think if I sang out of tune? Would you stand up and walk out on me? And it continues about, I get by with a little help from my friends. It's a lovely song about getting by. And uh, we don't just want to get by. We want to be enriched, and we want to do some enriching but that phrase, would, would you stand up and walk out on me? Yeah. To walk out on a friend, meaning abandoning him, kind of being unfaithful, no longer being his friend, it would be a very painful experience because our friendships, they are a large part of who we really are. And our relationships... They, they have a deep imprint on us. They forge something deep in us, especially as to who we really are today. Just as our parents helped to forge who we are, our friends too. And uh, so it's good now in the presence of God, when we have here, we ask, Lord, help me to reflect now on the role that I have in being friends to others. To help others get by, which is a kind of a low, it's a low goal, but maybe a higher goal, you know, not to enrich truly others. What am I giving to others in my friendships? What am I receiving from others? And naturally the model for us is Jesus. He himself, of course, did have friends. But he also had those who even stood up and walked out on him. As Ringo Starr says, would you stand up and walk out on me? Well, Lord, some walked out on you. In fact, this is the, there's only one recorded case of disciples turning away from Christ over doctrinal issues. And uh, that was in chapter 6 of St. John, which was the, the discourse on, on the bread of life. That might have been the doctrinal question that was the occasion for them to walk out on him because they were somehow scandalized by what he was saying, that he, they should eat his flesh and drink his blood. Obviously, they in some way misunderstood it. They took it too literally. They took it as a form of cannibalism of some kind. 
But it was not only a doctrinal question, it was also them losing or killing a friendship too. I have called you my friends, he said. Lord, how painful that must have been when some of your disciples stopped going with you after that discourse. These were not simply followers who accepted some of your ideas. They were your friends. They could have disagreed with what you said. They didn't, didn't have to understand everything. But they could have stayed as faithful friends. Because eventually everything would fall into place. And so we have here in John 6, aware that his disciples were grumbling about his teaching, Jesus asked them, does this offend you? Then what will happen if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? See there, he's making reference to the ascension. What, What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It's, it's a way of mitigating the sense of cannibalism. It's a way of saying that even when the Lord has ascended, the Eucharist is still valid. The truth of the teaching of the Eucharist is still there. We still receive the body and blood of Jesus, but it's the resurrected body and blood who has ascended into heaven. And yet he says that, you know, what will happen if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? And yet those to whom he was saying it would not see the ascension because they left. They stopped being his friends. Of course, we know the response of St. Peter. To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You, he's really saying, you are our friend. You're not just a guru. You're not just a a learned man. You're our friend. I don't want to lose that friendship, Lord. We can tell him now in our prayer during this recollection, Lord, you are our real friend. And now we understand from that what it really means to be truly connected with others. You, Lord, keep us grounded to what is solid, what is true, what is the meaning of all our endeavors, you give that meaning because you, you have known us and, and you are our friend. And we have trusted you as a friend. And with that friendship with Jesus, we learn all the refinements that are proper to friends. What friends say to each other. How they share experiences. How they listen to each other. How they suffer with each other like the sadness even that they will share, like the two em- disciples of Emmaus, who had seen the Lord crucified in the Passion, and they were on their way to Emmaus, and they were sad, and they were talking over it as friends supporting each other, making the blow more bearable. When, and finally, our Lord comes along with them and explains everything, and suddenly their hearts are, are enlightened, if you like, and they're strengthened. The bond between those guys, one of them being Cleophas, and the other one anonymous, but probably probably St. Luke, must have been so strong. How they support each other, how they ran back to tell the apostles. They, they were essentially deep friends. How many friends like that do I have? Like those disciples of Emmaus. And uh, there's a beautiful, beautiful painting by... Uh, Rembrandt, who he did, he did this in several versions of the moment in which the disciples of Emmaus see or recognize that it's the Lord. And the Lord is leaning back in a silhouette and they're looking at him and they're going, oh, this is Jesus. And it's almost as though the bond were greater between them than it was with the Lord. They're just seeing this manifestation that they didn't understand before. There in the light, he is in a silhouette. It's a beautiful, beautiful painting. Usually we see the scene in a, in a walkway somewhere, you know, on the road, and they're talking and they don't recognize. They're not so uh, taken by him, but now they're taken because it is you, Lord. So you've taught us 
and this is what we have to see in, in recollection. We examine ourselves. Okay, how is my refinement? You know, do, am I maybe able to fine-tune my ability to listen? Hmm? I know we have lots of work. We have many concerns in our head. You probably have concerns right now. Worries. Maybe the physical issues. Hmm? And all these issues that we have, our busyness and the schedules and work, all this may kind of drown out our ability to listen. It's as though uh, the radar that we had set for incoming calls had kind of lost its strength and we no longer uh, pick up the radar signals from our friends, their, their need, their, their need simply for an attentive ear. We can learn a lot from uh, Guadalupe and also from Isidoro. Both of them, of course, had learned uh, about the apostle of friendship and confidence from St. Jose Maria. Perhaps you know that story from the 1940s when Guadalupe used to organize all-night vigils in the center. She did the organizing. Others brought their friends. But what's uh, interesting is that we were told that she would stay awake in her office close to the oratory and she would be there like this is like in the middle of the night she would write letters and she would be there with her door open but she would be there in case some young woman wanted to share or you know amid the silence of the night just wanted to share her dreams uh, her friendships her resolutions her concerns and um, Guadalupe though a very orderly and, you know, person with capacity to plan things, had a great capacity for friendship, for friends. She had a gift, kind of, of getting along with people. She had this attractive warmth. She had these human virtues, this ability to laugh, to take others seriously. And... And she would look at others. She, you know, people would come and tell them her, her, their problems and she would take them seriously. Now, very often, if you go to a funeral with somebody who's older, the people that are there are mainly family and a few colleagues. But sometimes you go to a funeral and the place is packed. It's just packed. I mean, COVID put a stop to that for a while, but now it's coming back. But very often it's packed because these are just the contacts that that person made through friendship. What will my funeral be like? Will it be some siblings? Who will be there? Will my friends be there? Because I have a lot of friends. That's a gift that we ask for now. Jesus, I can learn from you how to be a friend, how to be a good listener, how to open up horizons and not be afraid to tell them certain truths. I mean, we know friendship is not just about having a beer and, and french fries together. Well, yeah, it is that, but not only that. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to tell them difficult truths, to tell them, you know, you're showing signs of, of selfishness here when you're doing that. I don't know, that's probably pretty hard to listen to. If we see that in a friend, to know how to correct them. And, you know, when Guadalupe stood up, it wasn't because, that is when she stayed awake like that, it wasn't because she was obliged to do so, she was following some kind of criteria, and nor were those younger women that were coming to speak to her doing it because she was the director and somehow they felt obliged to do it, this or render an account. They shared something in common. They wanted to talk to her. They were eager to do so. St. John Chrysostom remarked, if merely being from the same city is enough for many people to become friends, what should our love for one another be like? Who have the same home, the same table, the same path, the same door, 
the same life, the same head, the same shepherd and king and master and judge and creator and father. You know, these, are, these are all the things that we share in common with so many. Like our father became friends with uh, Isidoro because they were born in the same year. They were not originally from the same town. Isidoro, we know, was from a Spanish family in Argentina. But then he did move to Logroño. So, same year, both from Logroño. And so they were quite friends when they were young. And, you know, friendships when you're a child, when you're a young person, those friendships often don't have a very long uh, shelf life. They're the schoolyard friends that we have, that we play games with. But then after a while, everybody goes their separate ways, and we often lose contact. I mean, we had many friends when we were little children, because that those are the people that, you know, were in the schoolyard with us, and we probably remember many of their names. But that doesn't mean their friendship, they're, they're friends today, unless we really nourish them, unless we find motives to connect with them. Well, our father found a motive. He wrote Isidoro letters. Dear Isidoro, when you come to Madrid, be sure to come and see me. I have something very interesting to tell you. A hug from your good friend. I have something interesting to tell you. He was, he was ruminating about how to talk to Isidoro about the work. And then later on he told him. They got together, he told him, and, and we know. Yeah. Within a very short time, Isidoro gave his life to God in that way. Of course, I'm sure you receive thousands of emails, we all do, and text messages. They're not like the letters of old, but still letters or, or, or emails they can be an occasion to contact and to talk with others to open our hearts so that we meet them but we do have to ask the Lord to give us that sense of refinement that sense that ability to talk with others we ask you now for this Lord perhaps you know that story of a, a man who popped by to see his friend and he rang the doorbell and when the friend opened the door and he saw him, he was just suddenly overwhelmed with gratitude. He said, oh, I'm so happy you're here. Thank goodness you're here. I was, I mean, I was on the brink of disaster. And uh, so for an hour, he told him all his disasters, all his problems and all his concerns. And, uh, and uh, finally, after, I don't know how long, finally the visitor he said, well, look, I got to go, I got to go. It's, oh, oh, okay, sorry, 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 sorry. sorry uh, so they get to the gate and he's letting him go. And he says, oh yeah, by the way, why, why did you come and, like, how come you came to visit me? I forgot, I'm sorry, I was talking about my things and, uh, you know, what was it you want to talk about? And he said, the visitor smiled and he said, well, there's not much time to explain now, but, you know, I just came to tell you that uh, I've just been diagnosed with cancer and I have two months to live, you know. But anyway, anyway, you know, <laughs> I just have two months to live, but whatever. And, you know, you can imagine the distress of his friend, right, who was so wrapped up in his personal issues and questions. He wasn't aware that, he, that his friend actually had a pale look, you know. He was looking gaunt and... Uh, and uh, it was his friend that was looking for comfort and he was left without it but probably he was strengthened a lot by virtue of the fact that he actually was somehow forced to listen that actually enriched him more maybe I don't notice the paleness of my friend's face maybe I don't notice that they have cancer maybe I don't notice that they're worried maybe I don't notice that they're perhaps lonely. Maybe I just get a text message, but really, he's kind of reaching out. He just wants to talk. He may have a concern that may seem secondary to you, but maybe it would be worthwhile to listen. And, well, Lord, I don't want to be part of Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band. I mean, I don't want to be part of that band. It's... <laughs> It's, it's a sad, sad thing, but, well, maybe I want to go there to unlonelyfy those people. You know? mm -hmm. Because they say that 30% uh, of millennials feel lonely 
most of the time, if not all the time. You know? And perhaps they think they're interconnected by social media, and that's like, I don't know, they, you know, those are not the kind of friends that they really, really need. And maybe they've lost the vocabulary, many of them. They think that exchanging text messages is, is friendship, but, but then you talk to them and, and their eyes are, are glazing over, right? They're, they're not able to, to connect. And uh, so, well, we have to ask for that, uh, that ability. I read a book by this, uh, this author, Damien, Damien Fernandez Pedemonte, from uh, Argentina, from Buenos Aires. And he recounts in his book on the second conversion, it's all about his account of, of uh, the disciples of Emmaus, and, and he describes it as, as the second conversion is that second part of your life when you need a new conversion, right? When you're getting older and all the enthusiasms of youth have now faded and, and then you need to go up the second mountain, as we say. And he says, when I was 15 years old, I lost a brother who died at the age of 20 in a car accident along with three other young guys who all went to, to a um, field in, in the province of Buenos Aires to live a few days of Christian formation. I suppose they were going on in your course, I don't know. My father, 50 years old at the time, had to go and identify the body on the road. My mother never fully recovered from that tragedy. My sisters and I were deeply affected. But over time, I have realized that this was a very strong message from God which was followed in a short time by the conversion and vocation of several members of the family. Compared to that episode, the other dramas of life were minor. My story would have been different if I had not been able to see God behind that event. And he quotes here from Charles Journet, who wrote a book on evil. And he heads the book with this epigraph that says, There's a lot of light for those who want to see, and a lot of shadow for those who do not want to see. So, today we have to look at God's interventions, God's actions in my friendships, in my contacts. Because really, change can only come from God, and, you know, we have to, we have to ask for that, that, that he enliven that love for our friends in us. Because our, our father wanted us to have lots of friends. He wanted us to, to make that the basis of our apostolate. And, of course, our Lord himself, he experienced friendship. He experienced the love of his mother. He experienced the love of his friends. He experienced the love, loving fellowship or following of his disciples, the joy of the healing of multitudes, uh, the unwavering trust that he had in his heavenly Father, that intercommunion of life, but especially the love of his friends that even led him to speak about his, the, his friends, that he wanted us to be his friends just to ensure that we would never see ourselves as somehow distant servants or much less slaves. How are my friends going? Do I pray for them? Do I keep them in mind? Do I have a list of them so that I can remember to pray for them? Because they need my support. The more we pray for them, the more we'll be bonded to them, the more we will care for them. How can we really care for somebody that we don't really pray for? So we ask our Blessed Mother to give us that strength so that we be true friends of our friends. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations you've communicated to me in this meditation. I ask you help to put them into effect. 
my Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, and my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.